those of you who don't know who everybody is up here, that's Matt Plunk that was at the piano. He's our worship pastor, and uh, I'm Steve Davies. I'm the senior pastor. I want to invite you this morning, if you would, to open your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, last week we began a little series called Why I, and we asked the very first question, or answered the first question, why I believe in the fact of God. And, uh, you know, that was, I was a little bit concerned about being academic on that. I'm more concerned about being academic today because today is why I believe the Word, why I believe the Bible. And, and it's so easy to, to slide into that, and I want to be careful to try not to do so. But I do pray that out of this that you will gather nuggets and jewels that will help you in your Christian walk. Because one of the things that we need to understand is God has given us a direction manual for living life. He's given us these words that he might direct our footsteps, that he might prosper us, that he might give us uh, his plan as we accept his purposes that we might go forth. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read these words. Verse 14, Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy is, is Paul's son in the faith, and he says, You, however... Continue in the things that you have learned to become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us, that you've given it to us that we might walk with you and that we might have a manual of what the things are that we're supposed to be about. And Father, this morning as we bow before your throne of grace, I just ask you, Father, to take the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and use them to speak with power to your people today. For us in Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Someone said this. They said that even though heaven and earth and the visible church and man himself be crumbled into non-entity, he would, through grace, hold on to the Word of God as the unbreakable link between his soul and God. In other words, although all of else in life fails, although everything else falls apart, even though there's nothing else to hang on to, this man says, I will hang on to the Word. Here's a guy who believed the Word. And, and I think if I were to kind of survey you, and I'm not going to do that, but if I were to ask, how many of you believe the Word of God? Most everybody would believe the Word of God. And then if I were to ask, well, you know, uh, are there any parts of the Word of God that might be irrelevant for you today? You'd be amazed at how many people say, well, yes, I think there are parts of the Word of God that may not be relevant to me today. And any time that we decide to pick and choose and dissect that I'm going to believe this part and not this part, we are then guilty of not believing the Word of God. It's when we begin to say, well, I don't want that to apply to my life. We're doing things out of convenience, and we're not doing things out of obedience. We're not walking before the Lord as he would have us walk. Another text that we're going to turn to is in 1 Peter chapter 1, and there are three words that jump out to us here from this text. The Word of God is infallible. In 1 Peter 1, 25, it says the Word of the Lord. It's indestructible. It says it abides forever, and it's indispensable. It is the Word of good news which is proclaimed among the people, and that's what I want to focus on today. First of all, the infallibility of the Word of God. 1 Peter 1.25 once again says, the Word of the Lord. The Word of the Lord. Now, when we talk about this term infallible, you know, it means without error. Now, when we apply it to the Scripture, there's no way that, you know, we're saying that, that, um, that, that God has uh, put his divine approval on everything that's happened there, that everything that's happened there has been done in the realm of divine authority. For example, when, when, um, when Jacob deceived his father, he didn't have God's blessing on that. And when David was guilty of immorality and murder, he did not have God's blessing upon that. And we don't mean that our present-day translations don't have irregularities and they don't have faults within them. But at the very same time, it's important to note something. 
that there are over ele- that there are 1150 Old Testament manuscripts in the original language and when the Hebrew scholars work on these these manuscripts all agree on the essential uh, doctrines and truths and all that are there and so against a negative backdrop we need to understand that it is the word of the Lord and that word of the Lord is God's infallible record to man Peter says God's word and and that word Paul said is divinely inspired in in um, second Timothy all scripture not just part of it, but all of it. That means from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, and everything in between is inspired by God. Now, that word inspired, it, it means to breathe. God breathed these words into those ancient writers. He breathed those words into those prophets. He breathed those, uh, those words into those who would pin these words upon the paper. And this is what his inspiration is. It's the supernatural activity of God on the human mind by which the apostles and prophets and sacred writers were qualified to set forth divine truth without any mixture of error. Now, that's a great big definition. But it simply means that God, in his supernatural activity, worked on the hearts and the minds of those who wrote that they would write his message without error. And the validity of that definition uh, can be illustrated by, by what we call the miracle of the Bible's unity. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but the Bible is miraculous in the way that it is put together from Genesis to Revelation. I mean, think about the, trans, the transition in the culture in that day. The transition from what you read in the book of Genesis when God created the heavens and the earth and man who dwelt upon it to the day that Jesus comes and walks upon him. You know, think about how transitions have, have happened in our culture. You know, just back up, you know, just back up a hundred years. You know, most people were still getting around with animals to pull them or ride on. And, and not every house had a telephone. And certainly not every house had electricity. And even, you know, some of your great-grandparents cooked inside cooked on wood stoves in the kitchen think about that think about this how many of you are baby boomers you remember the weekly reader magazines that we got in school and it talked about a day when cars wouldn't be covered up in chrome do you remember i remember reading that in fourth grade and then you know they talked about a computer and they showed a picture of a computer And it took up a gigantic room. Who would have ever thought? But our culture has shifted dramatically. It shifted dramatically. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by by nearly 40 different authors of different backgrounds. It was penned in three languages. It was penned in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And the amazing thing is they were penned in countries that were far apart, yet the whole book is a harmonious whole. Dr. R.A. Torrey said it's not just a, a superficial unity, it is a profound unity. The unity of the Bible in the midst of such diversity shows that there's only one author, the author of the Holy Spirit. There's another miracle I'd like to, to point out to you, too, is the miracle of the Bible's accuracy when we talk about its infallibility uh, uh, to men. There are 333 prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And all 333 prophecies the Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled to the very letter, to the very dot of that prophecy. According to the law of probability, the odds of one person fulfilling all 333 of those prophecies to the, to the very letter of that prophecy is one in 83 billion. Is that not amazing? But the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills those. And so we find that record that comes to man. As a matter of fact, it was written in Acts 1.16, Brethren, the Scripture had to be filled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And so we find that this word is divinely inspired, but it's also divinely written. 
in 2 Peter 1.21, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. In other words, these men were impelled by God uh, with his power to speak forth his truth. They were able to see beyond their times. They were able to see and hear and record things outside the realm of their human imagination. And under his control, these fallible men became infallible instruments in the act of speaking and writing and sometimes even doing it unconsciously. Such as Jesus uh, with a, a, a certain high priest in his life. His name was Caiaphas. And Caiaphas uh, was high priest, and in Jan, John eleven forty nine, the Bible says that, this, that he said, you, that Caiaphas says, you know nothing at all. Now, he's prophesying. He's speaking to those who are following after Jesus. Nor do you take into account that it's expedient for you that one man die for the people and the whole nation not perish. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. He did it even unconsciously. And so the Lord, you know, as he gave us his word, sometimes worked through people in, in mysterious ways, but he always worked through people as he spoke. And it's divinely stamped. As a matter of fact, in Luke 24, 27, Jesus then beginning with Moses and all the prophets explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And so the Bible was not only inspired by God, it was not only composed by God, the Holy Spirit, but it was stamped or imprinted by Jesus, the Son. He put his stamp, not of approval, but his stamp of authority upon the Old Testament scriptures and upon the New Testament words that were yet to be written. Jesus said in John 14, 26, he said, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And what I find in the, in the New Testament, and particularly in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, th uh, four different writers that the Holy Spirit has brought to their mind all the things that he had said to them that are needed for you and I to have faith and to serve the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I mean, how many of you can remember in exact detail the events of your life? How, can, how many of you can remember in exact detail what happened yesterday? In exact detail now. What did you have for breakfast? Okay, Carson, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? Two pigs and a blanket. What did your dad do? Eat the other 15? What did you have for lunch? Because you're so full from those two little piggies. And uh, what did you have for dinner? A hamburger. Okay, now what did you do all in, in the rest of the day? What did you do at 10.01? <laughs> Eating breakfast at 10... That's brunch. <laughs> what did you do at 2.52? What about at 1.33? <laughs> what were you thinking about? What did you do at 8, 17 last night? What was it about? What was the exact scene at 8, 17? <laughs> I'm going to get you hooked right. <laughs> what I'm trying to illustrate is you can't remember every little thing that happens in your life. Can you? Every little thought you had at every moment of the day, unless you're Carson Fisher. Because we just don't. But the Holy Spirit inspired these writers to write. And Jesus told those who would write the New Testament that the Holy Spirit would bring into their remembrance all that they'd seen, all that they had learned from him. In John 16, he says, But when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And then under this infallibility rule, we find that we have God's infallible rule for people. 
this word of the Lord. You know, some people think that the Bible should be an authority over every area of life and over every subject, but that's uh, essentially a, a kind of a wrong view. The Bible was never uh, intended to teach knowledge to us about uh, the things that we could gain knowledge about. In other words, the Bible's not an authority on how to do algebra. Now, Carson is. But the Bible's not an authority on how to do algebra because, you see, God, he gave us, a, a, he created us in his own image. He gave us the body. We know the world beneath us. You know, our five senses. He gave us a spirit that we can know him. And he gave us a mind that we can know the world that's around us. God intends for us to work on things and to figure things out. And, you know, it's really neat when we do that kind of stuff. So the Bible's not a, an authority that gives you uh, information just so you can be, you know, a, 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 an information absorber and know a lot of different stuff. It was never uh, meant to do that. Sir, Sir Charles Marston, this guy I ran across in my research this week, uh, he was a, an Englishman, and uh, he loved the Bible. He grew up in a Christian family. He was neither, you know, a conservative nor was he a liberal. He was just kind of down in the middle, but one of the things he loved was archaeology. He just wasn't an archaeologist, but he made a lot of money, so he funded some archaeologists who did the dig at Ur and did some of the Dead Sea stuff and um, have made some amazing discoveries. And this is what he said. He said, there are no contradictions between facts stated in the Scriptures and the facts that have been ascertained and brought to light in any department of literary or scientific research. So there's no, there's no contradictions. Now, here's what we find. In scientific research... Early on, the greatest scientist of all time declared that the world is flat. You remember reading about those guys? They said the world is flat. As a matter of fact, they even looked into the heavens at night and they counted the stars. One guy said, I count 999 stars. And the other scientist a year later said, oh, no, you're wrong. There are 1,001. As a matter of fact, science and medical science said in the early days, well, when people get sick, here's what we need to do. In ancient Egypt, the, the medical doctor said you get a cut. The way to cure that is by putting donkey dong. Some of you don't know what that is. How many of you don't know what that is? Everybody's got that? Been to school? Put it on the cut. What are they saying? And then even years later, even in the founding of our nation, George Washington, our first president, oftentimes uh, he would become ill. And, and you know what they did when you got sick back then? They cut you. They bled you. And, and it was at the barber shop. That's why the, the, the little pole outside the barber shop is red and white. It represents blood and gauze. And, and actually, George Washington got bled to death, and Washington has been trying to get us back ever since. <laughs> but they bled to death. Now, understand the Bible is not an authority on science, Right? or literary things, but it speaks truth. The Bible says, had the early scientists read this in the book of Jeremiah, it says that the earth hangs as a sphere in space. It doesn't hang as a flat thing in space. It hangs as a sphere. It hangs as a ball. You know, it's round hanging in space. Isn't that amazing? And if you read the book of Genesis, this is what the Bible says about bleeding people, that the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. But yet it's not a scientific authority, nor is it a medical authority, but the Bible's always truthful, and therefore it's never going to be proven wrong. The Bible was intended to be the infallible record to man and the infallible rule of men in all matters of our faith and of our practice. In this book, we have God's record to us about how he has worked on our behalf in order that we might know him. And in this book, we have God's record to us of how we might respond to him who has made himself known. That's what the Bible's here to do. It's his written word. It's the deposit of our salvation as our rule of faith and obedience. It's our only rule. We as a people do not have, um, have um, my word just slipped away from me because I was sounding so good. Um, we don't have, um, help me, Dan. You know what I'm thinking, man? 
We, we don't have, we're not a, not the creed word. We don't have, um, oh shoot. I know Matt doesn't know. He just leads music, right? No. <laughs> You're a union man. What am I thinking, Matt? You know, we're not a, um, we, 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 we live by a statement of faith as, uh, as Baptists that, that says, you know, that the, wor- that the Word of God is our, is our only document for faith and practice. And I can't think of that other word. You know, other, other group, church groups have added in these extra words about all this kind of stuff. Never mind, that's not important. What we have is God's Word, which is our, our document as we live and as we, as we serve God, as we serve one another. And, and, and God then foretells us through Paul, he said, all the Scripture is God-breathed. It's all inspired by God. It's profitable to us for teaching, for doctrine, for, for, for reproof. It's profitable in all these ways that we might be trained in righteousness that the man of God might be adequate. Listen. Not just men, but women, and not just adults, but teenagers, not just snowbirds, but uh, spring breakers, and, and permanent people, and all that kind of stuff. You will never be the person that God wants you to be until you dig into His Word and begin to make application of that Word to your own life and to your own heart. You know, you can read all the writers. I hear these writers thrown out left and right. You know, I believe your Sunday school uh, re- lesson this, this uh, week's written by John Stott. Great writer. Great Christian man. Some of you know you're, you're in love with Francis Chan. You think, man, he's got something. But listen, there's no other book that is as important for you to love and to know than what God has penned for you, his love letter. His love letter of his mercy and his grace as he reaches into your life to give you hope and to give you a future. So the Bible's infallible, but also the Bible's indestructible. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter, but the word of the Lord, it endures forever. The Bible's indestructible in that it outlives our our enemies. It outlives our foes. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And again, he said the scripture cannot be broken. Think about the indestructible nature of the Bible. It's always been preserved. The Bible contains within its covers the oldest books in all the world. The first parts of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the the, the five uh, books of Moses were written some 3,000 years ago and nearly 100 years earlier than any other history that we have. Herodotus, one of the oldest historians whose writings uh, are with us today, was a contemporary, you got to turn over a little bit further, of Ezra and Nehemiah and the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. And between these and Moses, there was an interval of a thousand years. And through its long history, the Bible's been burned, it's been hidden, it's been criticized, it's been ridiculed, it's been neglected. Yet God has preserved it. The unbelievers, the infidels, have for centuries, you know, tried to fire away at the Bible and, and, and make it irrelevant and, and say it's not truthful and, and say that it's all wrong. But yet in all of their doing, it's, all, it's, it's like they, they take a, a bucket of sand from the coast and move it over a foot and it just washes out flat again. They cannot touch it. Voltaire. Toward the very end of his life, he declared that his writings, Voltaire, arrogance. He declared that his writings would replace the Bible within a hundred years and that the Bible would barely be remembered, if not completely unknown. And in all of the arrogance of, of that man, within 25 years of his death, the publishing house which published Voltaire's works became the center for the Geneva Bible Society and 90 beautifully bound volumes of all the work of Voltaire could barely be sold at the yard sale. It only fetched pennies, it said. While at the very same time there was an old manuscript of an Old Testament uh, uh, book that sold for multiplied thousands of dollars. What irony that man in all of his arrogance 
Voltaire and all of his enlightened thinking said that his writings would replace the Bible within 100 years. But within 25 years, his writings could barely be sold, and the Geneva Bible Society took over that publishing house. Isn't God awesome? Isn't God awesome? What does he do to arrogance? He knocks it down. He says pride comes before the fall. If Voltaire had read the truth of Scripture in that kind of arrogance and that kind of a pride, he would have known that his uh, publishing house would fall to the Bible itself. Because how many of you have heard of Voltaire besides this morning? There's a lot of you that haven't. And of all of you that have heard of Voltaire, do you know anything that he wrote? Huh. Not unless you just happen to be in that enlightenment class in college that specialized. God's Word endures forever. It's not ceased to be published. The, be the Bible has never been off the printing press. At least one book of the Bible has been translated into over 1,200 languages, and 469 languages have the entirety of manuscript of the Bible in their own language. That's amazing. The annual sales figures for the Bible are so high, they average between 425, 425 million and 650 million every year, year after year, that dwarfs the sales of other books. Even the most popular book that even could somewhat come close, the Harry Potter series. Y'all know Harry Potter? You know, you go to Universal, you go through Harry Potter's uh, village and all that kind of stuff, and, and you wait for the rest of the family to ride those rides or whatever that's there. You know, Harry Potter stuff has sold a bunch of, the, uh, a bunch of books, but, um, the, the, but it doesn't stand, uh, it, it can't even stand up to the stature and to the nature of the Scripture. Guinness Books of World Records reports that there are an estimated 2.5 billion Bibles printed between 1815 and 1975. The Economist estimate, estimates that more than 100 million new Bibles are printed every year, making a staggering total of over 6 billion in print. The New Yorker pointed out in 2005 the number of Bibles sold in the U.S. alone was conservatively estimated at 25 million. Barna research indicates that 92% of all American households have at least one Bible, and typically there are three. That means that most of the 25 million Bibles that are being sold in homes uh, are being sold to homes that already have at least one and likely more. By comparison, Harry Potter series, seven books in all, sold only 400 million copies total, and no one expects that pace to keep up. And there's nothing to, to suggest that, this classic, that it will become a classic, and I doubt that existing owners are going to buy a second, third, or fourth copy to have in different rooms of the house. Nothing compares to the Bible. It's been on the press. As missionary literature goes, it's the number one piece of missionary literature. Now think about this. We've come together in worship this morning, and we're from all over, right? Who came the furthest to come to church here today? Any Canadians left? Okay, a couple of Canadians. Anybody from the great Northwest? Anybody come across the waters? Okay, we're all just home folk, but our home folk are made up of, of some different kinds of folks. You think about this this morning. Up here in the band area, for example, on piano and on keyboard and on drums, part of our Brazilian congregation, on electric guitar. You know, we, we had Ott, who uh, was born in Laos, and I think about this, that we have missionaries today that are working among language groups for whom there's been no written word, like Lisa Kapler in Papua New Guinea among the Wabaku people. And she's listening, and, and you know, a pig runs across the yard, and she, talks, and she hears the people talk about the pig and their, their dialect and their language, and she picks it up and she writes it down, and soon she constructs their, their, uh, their language on paper and had their language been, Ott, are you still in the room? Or did you go to early church? I'm looking for Ott. Okay, there he is. Had their language been Laotian, the name for that little pig that ran across the yard would have been Ott. I've never forgotten that because he told us that in a testimony one time many years ago that his name means little pig. 
right? <laughs> I love Ott. And you know, some of you are from the deep south, and some of you are from the frozen plains of the north. Some of you are from various places around the earth, but God has gathered us up, and his one word, no matter what language it's translated into, is powerful. So powerful that it penetrates our hearts and separates the bone from the marrow. Isn't that an amazing thing? Robert J. Thomas, he was haunted by the thought of the, of the hermit kingdom, otherwise known as the Koreans, not having the word of Jesus Christ. He was a missionary in China, and, and he would make journeys down into Korea because their languages are very similar. And he'd pass out pa gospel tracts and gospel pamphlets trying to get the, the gospel to the Korean people. A few years later, the, Amer uh, the United States decided to try to establish relations with Korea, and they sent a, a, uh, a ship over there loaded with sailors and a couple of diplomats. And, uh, and when they got there, the name of the ship, by the way, was the General Sherman. This is kind of ironic, too. But the General Sherman and uh, the, the Koreans ordered them to leave. They refused to do so, and, the, and the, the ship became mired up in the mud and couldn't move. And so the Koreans would attack it, and these men would fight them off. It lasted for um, maybe a month or two. And, and eventually, you know, the governor in the, in the Korean province was totally fed up with it. And they attacked, and they set the ship on fire. And the reason I say it's ironic, because Sherman marched through the south and burned down most of the south in his, in his path. But he, he set that ship afire, and on that ship was this, uh, was this missionary by the name of Robert J. Thomas who had caught a passage ride there, who had brought Bibles to distribute among the Koreans. When they were about to execute Roger J. Thomas, the Korean man who eventually executed him said that he had such a look in his eye that he took the Bibles that this man had brought because there had to be something different about his life. And he ended up wallpapering the inside of his house with the pages of that scripture, and his neighbors would come, and they would read that scripture, and eventually his nephew would become the pastor of the very first church in Korea. And South Korea now is more than 40% Christian. It has some of the largest Christian churches on the entire planet, but it was the Word of God. There was not even a man that was there delivering it, except with a glow on his face as his head was about to be taken off. But the Word of God, powerful and active and sharper, the book of Isaiah says that, that God said, um, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, and, it will not, uh, and, it and without succeeding in the manner for which I've sent it. And so that's absolutely amazing to me. But let's get down to the brass tacks of why I believe the Bible. And it's wrapped up in this last point because the Bible is indispensable. It's indispensable. You can't live without it. The word of the Lord endures forever, and it's the word that was preached to you. The New Revised says it's the word that is the good news that was announced to you. You know, there's a lot of great reading material out there, but I don't need to read it all. You know, I don't have to read Francis Chan. I don't have to read John Stott. I don't have to read John Piper. I don't have to read uh, John Calvin. There's a lot of Johns in the Christian world, right? You know, I don't have to read all that stuff. I don't have to read the magazine subscriptions. I don't have to do all that kind of stuff. But one thing that I really need in my life is I need the Word of God. If I'm going to be equipped, if I'm going to be ready, if I'm going to know how to face life, if I'm going to know uh, how to handle things when I get slapped in the face, if I'm going to know how to handle life when I get on top and, and pride tries to rise up, if I'm going to know uh, how it's to walk through the valley and whose hand to hold and whose uh, guidance to, to believe, I've got to be a person who, who not only is a person of faith, because we all have faith. You all have, you're all exercising faith this morning. You came into a room that you felt would be uh, appropriately uh, moderated with temperature. You sat down in chairs that you didn't build, and you found out that your faith was uh, solid as you sat 
in that chair, that that chair was not going to collapse underneath you. you, you uh, you've exercised faith in everything. You exercise faith when you put your key in the car and, and, and turned it so as to crank it. You exercise faith uh, drinking coffee uh, that someone else made or, or uh, eating uh, you know, pigs in a blanket, whatever it may be, you've exercised faith in some form or in some fashion. Fashion People, it doesn't matter if they're Christian or not, they are people who exercise faith. But what I exercise my faith in matters. You know, I can believe that chair is not going to let me fall and hit the floor, but I can also know that that chair is not going to take me to heaven. It's not going to be sufficient. I can believe that when I turn the key in my car that uh, it's going to turn that engine over and it's going to cause that car to crank and I can depend upon that car to get me to where I need to be, but I cannot really depend upon it to get me to where I ought to be is in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. And so the Bible, it contains the only word of the gospel for people. That gospel is God's good news because apart from the good news of God, we live in a bad news world. If you don't believe that, watch CNN, HLN, MSNBC, Fox, and all the others. I'm sick of their bad news. I'm sick of it. It's time that we, the people of God, focus upon the living God who's more powerful than the newsmakers, who's more powerful than the most powerful man on the planet, who is the Lord God himself, and the Word of God endures forever. In that Word of God, we have the revelation of God himself. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, has now spoken to us in his Son. Jesus Christ is the final and full authoritative revelation of God, and the Bible is the final and full authoritative revelation of Jesus Christ. When I open this book, I find from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation that every page of this book is revealing to me the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of man, I find a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. God curses a serpent and says, you'll crawl on your belly, and he, he will crush your head, head, although you will bruise his heel. I've jumped forward several centuries, and I come to the time in which the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. Satan thought that he had struck a deadly blow to the heel of the Son of God when he died on the cross. But in reality, reality, on the third day, when the stone was rolled away, the Bible says that he was risen, just as he said, and Jesus had actually struck the death blow to the head of that serpent. Satan is a defeated foe. We serve a living Savior. We serve a victorious Savior. We serve a God who's real, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and has the ability to, to, to touch your heart and touch your life with his power and with his hope. And it tells us about the redemption of man. The, Lord, the word of the Lord endures forever, bringing good news to you. You know, you and I, we need redeeming. You know, we're lost. We've all sinned. We've all failed. We've all missed the mark. The Bible tells us that. There's none righteous, no, not one. You know, we've all messed up. We need redeeming. And we can't redeem ourselves. No matter how hard we climb, we never seem to get there. No matter how good we try to be, we always blow it. We always fail. You ever find yourself like that? You know, like yesterday, we're driving over to Pensacola. I'm just driving along, got on my seatbelt. My wife's got on her seatbelt. My daughter's got on her seatbelt. We're on our way to a soccer game. We're just having a good time. And there sits a Florida highway patrolman. He comes out behind me. Barely says, how fast are you going? I said, a little too fast. <laughs> Lights flash. He pulls me over. I pull into a side street off a of busy 98. He said, sir, do you know how fast you're going? And I said, yes, I think I was running 65-ish. He said, well, you only missed it by, by two. You're only doing 63. And then he said, sir, do you know what the speed limit is here? And I said, I think it's 55. He said, oh, no, it just changed to 45. He said, where do you live? I said, Miramar Beach. I was just up front and honest with him. He said, well, give me your, your license, your registration, your insurance. Well, I had the license and the registration, and my insurance card was only about two years old. When he didn't close his car door, I felt okay. 
You know, I was just minding my own business. But I still messed up. Okay, I didn't get a ticket, though. Just a warning. I didn't, I didn't say I knew Joe. <laughs> I prayed that double it. But, you know, I, I owned it. And that's what we have to do in our own lives. I mean, we have to own it. We've all sinned. I mean, I didn't mean to. I was just driving. I, I was drinking a cup of coffee. You know how that goes? Oh, don't act innocent. <laughs> Some of you probably got that on the way down here to vacation. But isn't that the way life goes? You don't even have to try to mess up. And you do. We need to be redeemed. And you know the good news that he brought to me, he said, Sir, I'm not going to give you a ticket for speeding. I'm going to do you a favor. Here's a warning. But here's a ticket for not having your insurance card. But if you bring your insurance card here to the Santa Rosa Courthouse, they'll forgive it. So I'll have to drive. It's going to cost me a tank of gas. But you know, that was good news, but it wasn't completely good. The good news that God gives me is that when I place my faith in Jesus Christ, He forgives. I don't have to bring anything else extra. I don't have to pay a $10 fine for not having the card on me. He forgives me completely. He washes my slate clean. He makes me pure. The Bible says, though, your sins be red like scarlet. That means to be double dyed, double dipped. They shall be as white as snow. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, there's salvation in no one else. For there's no other name given under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. It speaks to our personal salvation. He told, Paul told Timothy, from your childhood, you've been taught the scriptures that lead to salvation in Christ Jesus. It talks about our social integration, how we get along as husbands and wives. How do you get along? Well, maybe not so good this morning. But how do you practice getting along? Paul wrote, and he said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you that's how you get along with your parents that's how we get along with one another and maybe one of the most important words that we could hear today as people who live in north america it speaks to our national reformation we need a reformation i don't know if you've noticed that or not but on a national level, there needs to be a reformation. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, and sin is a disgrace to any people. The Bible is the only authority on the type of righteousness that exalts a nation. No other book has to its credit such a record of lives redeemed, of moral outcasts regenerated, of the distressed and anxious souls that have been cheered on, and of individuals and nations that have been made, uh, remade. The world uh, has never known a higher code of ethics than the code of ethics that the Bible gives us to be just and to have mercy to all people. No other book is so influenced, uh, has so influenced for the good, both literature and language and art and music and education. Personal and social and national prosperity only comes as we exercise righteousness. Bruce Bursma, perhaps in the most telling article of all, wrote in the Chicago um, Tribune an article called Bible Cure for the U.S., Mies, which appeared March the 4th of 1982. Now, I know some of you were not born in 1982, but in 1982, the world and our nation was turned upside down. We'd gone down economically, we'd gone down politically, we'd gone down uh, in, our, in our military strength. It was a mess. And this is what Mies had to say. He said, presidential, or, or this is what Bursman had to say, and he quoted me. He said, presidential counselor Edwin Meese, a layman in the Lutheran Church Synod, told a gathering of conservative Christians here, bracket San Diego, that the Bible holds the answers to the nation's problems. How about that? 30 years ago. The Bible holds the answers to our nation's problems. 30 years ago, three decades ago, the Bible holds the answers to our nation's problems coming from the White House. 
and the counsel to the president. And we have forgotten God. He goes on and says this, speaking of the start of a four-day Congress on the Bible, me said, nothing is more important in this nation today than this conference on the Bible. Not unemployment, not rebuilding our defense capabilities. What is important is rebuilding our relationship to God and a right view of the Bible. There is a nation, there is in our nation a general poverty of the soul, and too many of our people have taken too many wrong roads. We need a reliable roadmap, and that roadmap is the Bible. And me said, President Reagan applauds the involvement of Bible believing Christians in the public policy debates. Folks, we need Mises' prescription for our nation once again. Some of you need Mises' prescription for your family relationships or your work relationships. You need it in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, the Bible is infallible. It will not lead you astray. You need to learn it. The Bible is indestructible. You're, there's nothing that's ever going to destroy this Word. You may burn this copy, but the Word of God endures forever. Therefore, love it. And it's indispensable. Live it. The Bible says if you're without Jesus Christ, the very first step in living it is to come to trust Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Some of you need to do that today. Right where you are, you need to bow and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and forgive me of my sin and be my Savior and give me the strength to live for you. Some of you need to take steps of obedience. God's calling you to different places to do different things. Sometimes it's simple, like baptism, rejoicing as we rejoice this morning. Sometimes it seems a little difficult. Like, I can't imagine what Lisa felt when she felt God was calling her to the Wabaku people of Papua New Guinea from Tampa, Florida. But God will never lead you where his grace will not sustain you. Would you surrender to the Lord today? It might be really simple, like becoming a part of this church family. You come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory. To you be the honor. To you be all praise as we turn our hearts to you. Father, thank you for your word that never leads us astray. For a word that can never be destroyed. And for a word that is the very word of life to our souls. We give you praise. I pray for those that are making those decisions right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. You come right now. First note, first verse, come on. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting. Like a ship without a sail, Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. him how lost I would be without him I would be dying without him I'd be enslaved without him life would be hopeless but with Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus.
Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Man, we would be lost without Jesus, amen?